As the era of Battle Royale games continues onward, many new entries fall to the wayside, they're unable to compete with the monoliths. In order to succeed in this genre, bringing something new to the table is an absolute must, and Fall Guys delivers originality in spades, along with a heavy dose of charm and fun. It's one of those titles that anyone can pick up and play, but you'll find yourself instinctually getting better and better as you navigate the minigames more and more times. There's a certain level of mastery to Fall Guys, but the game of course includes an element of randomness to keep things fresh and entertaining for players of all skill levels. It's stunning that such a simple, yet genius concept is just now being made into a game, but I'm glad that it is. Fall Guys is a breath of fresh air, an endless source of laughs and fun, and a slam dunk must play for anyone, especially if you have a PS4 with PlayStation Plus because it's free during the month of August. So what makes Fall Guys such a success? Well, without a doubt, it's the minigames, and so let's take a look at what makes them so great. So welcome to my review, as well as my analysis of every minigame in Fall Guys. Fall Guys is a battle royale, but it's not of the tired shooter genre like many of its contemporaries. Instead, Fall Guys is what you get when you mix battle royale with Mighty Beans and Wipeout. It's a set of goofy minigames that sees you competing against 59 other foes in order to be the last one standing, quite literally in some cases. Every round starts with 60 players, and each round may have up to 5 minigames, but sometimes less. Each minigame has a threshold though for how many participants can advance to the next round, and the last minigame is a round that sees only one winner. It's straightforward in the best possible way. At launch, there are 24 minigames for players to experience, and there's a surprising amount of variety on offer. Some minigames are skill-based, while others are more luck of the draw. Some see you competing solo against everyone else, while others have you team up. One of the smartest decisions that Mediatonic made while crafting this game was the choice to have different categories of game types, which helps keep things fresh through each and every round. So in order to be as thorough as I can, what I'd like to do now is go through every single mini game that's available to play and share my thoughts on them. This game is getting a lot of praise, and rightfully so. However, I do think some of the minigames do a better job at creating a chaotic and goofy environment, much more so than others. And at the end, I'll summarize my thoughts by sharing the number of games that I think are great additions, average experiences, and poor inclusions. So let's kick things off by looking at the first of four categories of game types, races. As the name suggests, racing minigames see players going through obstacle courses in order to finish in the top percentage of players in order to qualify for the next minigame. If you cross the finish line within the threshold, you're good, but if not, you're eliminated. Races are by far the biggest category and therefore contain the most games. To me, the racing games encapsulate the fun that Fall Guys is best at providing, so let's see why that is. DoorDash is a racing minigame where players must reach the finish line by finding the correct path through matching doors. The catch is that some of the doors are immovable, while others will bust free, allowing passage. If you've ever watched MXC on Spike TV in the early 2000s, you'll recognize this style of game. Anyway, I don't dislike this minigame, but it is certainly one of the more luck-based ones. If you're leading the pack, you're the one to make the initial decision about which door to bust, but if you're behind the leaders, it becomes a case of just following the already opened doors. Ideally, you stay towards the second wave of players and make it through each open door to secure a spot in the next round. DoorDash is categorized not only as a racing game, but also one that can be selected when a large player pool is still alive, and this was a good idea. If you're going to have a minigame with luck having a bigger role, then it's smart to allow the highest number of players to advance through it. 
It can still be a lot of fun, but I'm gonna have to put this one in the average category. In a game that specializes in themed obstacle courses, Hit Parade is the one that focuses on knocking you down to halt your progress. They litter the field with many moving objects that can hinder you, but they aren't spammed in a way that ensures you'll constantly be getting knocked down. It's very possible to master this course and move your way through it without being hit once, and it's a great feeling when you're able to accomplish that. It creates a skill gap that isn't always present in some of the other game types, and I like that. And here's a tip for you, just go right through the propellers and then go left through the swinging balls and the slime path. It's that simple. I do this every time and it works every time and I really feel a sense of mastery over this game. Again, this is a game about creating chaotic fun and this is another game that serves that purpose and that purpose alone. It's great. Fruit Shoot is by far the toughest minigame to master, and it's one that I think will be controversial amongst player viewpoints. The goal here is to reach the finish line while running up a treadmill that is constantly pushing you backwards. Meanwhile, cannons launch oranges, bananas, and other assorted fruits at you, which will knock you down if they make contact, and sometimes sweep you over the edge, forcing a restart. It can be difficult to track the fruit as it comes down at you, leading to a lot of blindside hits that feel a little bit unfair. On top of that, there's a lot of fruit on the path at all times, making it kind of difficult to navigate, maybe a little too much so. And a lot of these problems compound right at the beginning when you first jump down on the platform. This is a game that if you can make it halfway up, you're probably going to advance. Some people can argue that the amount of fruit being thrown at you needs to be toned down a notch, while others will say the inclusion of a more difficult game is a good thing, and I personally tend to agree with the latter point, because whenever this game pops up as the selection, I know that it's going to weed out the pretenders from the contenders, and for that reason, I'm going to give Fruit Shoot a big thumbs up and place it in the great category. Seesaw was the first minigame I ever experienced in Fall Guys, and it was a good one for indicating just what I was getting myself into. Every player is tasked with racing to the finish line as they move across balance boards that are not afraid to tip over to extreme angles and send you barreling down. This one can make you rage pretty dang hard, but it can also make you feel light as a feather if you manage to glide over the seesaws without tumbling down. This is one of the better racing games, and games as a whole, because it not only gets your heart racing as you desperately try to stay upright and balanced, but also because it challenges you mentally to understand how the other players are moving. It's always important to know just how many other players are on the board with you, so you can do your best to avoid tipping things over too drastically. The only negative component to this game is that one of the checkpoints is split into two, and the next section begins with only one seesaw, meaning that if it's tipped out of your favor, you'll be stagnant and you're going to be waiting for it to come down. Now you can always jump off and try to respawn on the other side, but it does slow down the pace of the race. But for the most part, this is a very solid entry to the roster, and it's easy for Pandemonium to break out, making it awesome. Slime Climb is top tier. It really is a top tier entry because while it's classified as a racing minigame, which it should be, it's also pretty much a survival one too. You are tasked with reaching the finish line before X amount of other players, and in order to do so, you have to navigate an obstacle course that's focused on pushing you back down the hill. Every obstacle is meant to knock you down to the lower slope, which not only jeopardizes your chances of progressing, but also puts you closer to the slime. That's right, as this level plays out, slime slowly consumes the field of play, and if you get caught in it, you are instantly eliminated. It adds an extra level of tension to all your actions, and that's appreciated. If you're skilled on the controller and with timing, you can actually create shortcuts in this minigame too, which is an added bonus. Just be warned, people love to troll on this map by reaching the top and grabbing players before they can cross the finish line and forcing them to die in the slime. I take it as lighthearted fun, but beware. 
And because of all these reasons, Slime Climb is without a doubt one of the best entries in the roster. Gate Crash is similar enough to DoorDash that I get them mixed up from time to time. The idea is simple, reach the end of the course by making it through gates that are constantly opening and closing. This game requires a sense of timing and direction and can easily fool your brain into choosing the wrong path which may get you eliminated. My issue with Gate Crash is that after you play it a few times, you can start to memorize the patterns and use that to your advantage for an easy advancement. There are a few games that I've noticed contain variations within them, with the different patterns of obstacles, and I think Gate Crash really needed that. The timing for each gate opening and closing has always been the same every single time I've played it, and so it feels like it's too easy. This doesn't make it a bad minigame per se, but it also doesn't make it very exciting. I'll mark it down as average, but it's probably towards the bottom of that tier. We're coming back with a passion though because the Whirly Gig is one of the best levels for creating laugh out loud funny moments because the bars can send you flying at any point. And sometimes it's a good thing. You're asked to navigate a series of moving pillars, some horizontal, some vertical, and progress without getting blasted off into oblivion. It's always enjoyable seeing someone get launched off the map, and it happens a lot in this game. The first half of the map introduces you to the mechanic nicely with slower moving pillars, but by the time you reach the back half, those pillars are hauling ass looking to destroy you. The Whirly Gig is also one of the few maps that allows for some risk and reward shortcuts, as during the final stretch, you have three paths to choose. Two of them are identical, they are safer and slower, whereas the middle one saves a lot of time, but it's really hard to get past. The massive windmill is moving so rapidly that it's nearly impossible to jump through without getting tossed around like a ragdoll. However, if you do make it by, you'll be ahead of the pack. And the last major obstacle is having to wait on a platform with a moving bar as another whirly gig continuously blocks and opens up a path to the finish line. It is so hilarious seeing players waiting for the opening only to get jettisoned by the moving bar. What I'm trying to say is that there's a lot of antics within the whirly gig and it also presents a decent challenge with player options so I'm gonna have to give it a great mark and that comes pretty easily. The gimmick behind Dizzy Heights is that basically every platform you move across is a spinning circle and falling off means restarting or dropping to a lower level. It's not a bad idea on paper and I don't dislike this minigame, but I don't think it's one of the better ones for a few reasons. First of all, the second part of this course is a mini maze where you have to sneak past rolling balls and that's fine, but the issue is that it doesn't have anything to do with the theme of spinning. It feels out of place. On top of that, in the latter half of the course, you can screw up on the spinning wheels and fall to the ground to advance without having to show mastery over that obstacle. I also believe that the spinning platforms aren't really that hard to navigate either so long as you continue to go with the flow. This is painfully obvious at the beginning of the course where players seem to zoom past it without any trouble at all. Dizzy Heights has too many minor issues for me to put it in the great tier but it's still alright for what it is. Tiptoe is one of the more unique racing mini games as it comes with a twist. Yes, you want to be one of the first to reach the finish line, but it's going to take a lot of trial and error to get there. And normally, trial and error in games isn't seen in a positive light, but in this case, I really think it is. You are presented with a set of tiles, but the problem is that some of them will break after being touched. Your job is to find the path forward in order to reach the finish line. Leading the pack means being a risk taker and accepting that you could fall off at any time. However, you could end up being the first to finish because of it. On the other hand, being a follower means that you can watch others find the correct path, but you may lag behind and lose. The other issue with being a follower is that sometimes you'll bunch up and accidentally fall off a platform that collapses. Both sides have pros and cons, which creates a nice point of balance. On top of that, these two roles are constantly switching as players fall off and respawn at the starting point. 
It leads to a lot of dynamic perspective shifting within this game mode, and that makes it one of the best experiences in Fall Guys. Survival games are about outlasting your opponents and doing your best to not screw things up. The goal here is simply to outlive contestants until the elimination threshold is reached in order to move on to the next game. Rollout is all about balance and obstacle navigation. There are five rolling cylinders that each have their own sets of obstacles and you're tasked with not falling off and keeping yourself upright. This is one of those games that quickly weeds out new players, but can go on for quite a while once the weenies have been eliminated. This is another one of those games that I've played enough times to recognize the patterns and know exactly where to go to avoid falling. And as we'll see, the next game in the list that I'm going to talk about has two patterns that can spawn, and I think Rollout would have benefited from that by keeping players on their toes with different variations. That being said, I don't dislike Rollout. It can get pretty frantic as you wait for those final few players to get eliminated, and if you put yourself in a bad position, it can require a Herculean effort to get out of. It's another one of those games that keeps you moving, and because of that, I'm going to mark it down as great. Block Party is similar to Rollout in that you're given a very confined space to stand on while having to dodge oncoming obstacles. The goal of this game is to not get shoved off the small platform while navigating the incoming blocks to reach safety. Each block will sweep you off the stage unless you make it to one or two of the small cracks in it where you can stay upright. Eventually, these safe areas get smaller and smaller and even require players to jump over some of them in order to advance. And by the end, the small space is shrunk down to a third of the size as you have to move through even smaller areas. The challenge of Block Party is consistently getting more difficult without being overwhelming, and I really appreciate that touch. On top of that, I've also noticed two or three variations within Block Party for how blocks can spawn. This means that unlike in other minigames, you can't always memorize the patterns and then execute on that alone. It requires a certain level of adaptation out of the player while also challenging their skills on the controller, making this a fantastic experience. Perfect Match is one of the weakest minigames because it doesn't really utilize the crazy physics or adrenaline pumping sensation that the other games do. You have 15 seconds to memorize a set of 12 tiles and when the timer hits zero, the screen displays a type of fruit. You have to then locate where that fruit is and stand on that platform. If you guess right, you're safe, but if you guess wrong, you fall and get eliminated. The first issue is that the game is so stagnant. You hardly ever have to move and will spend most of the time standing still as you memorize fruit locations. The second issue is that you hardly even have to try and memorize all the fruit locations because a majority of the time other players will do the work for you and you just have to move to the correct square. If you follow the crowd, you'll almost always be safe. I'm glad that Fall Guys doesn't have a mechanic that lets you push other players because it would be abused by trolls. However, this is one game mode where it may have made for an interesting inclusion. But as it is now, Perfect Match is the worst minigame because it is so antithetical to the core experience of Fall Guys. Jump Club is one of those games that always puts a smile on my face when I see it pop up because it can get pretty crazy in a hurry. You and the other players are stuck on a platform with two spinning bars. The first bar requires you to jump over it, and the other one, a double-sided variant, requires you to duck under it. The two bars are moving at different speeds, and that speed consistently gets quicker and quicker. It is essential for players to keep track of the timing and not get caught in a position where both bars are hitting them at once. If they do, you're going to go flying and get eliminated most of the time. There have been a few rare occasions where I felt like I should have been launched off into the sky and somehow slipped through, but I'm not complaining about that, let's be honest. The quickening of the bar's movement speed allows for dynamic rhythms that require a lot of player attention and reaction, making it another worthwhile addition. 
Oh, and by the way, they're bringing a variation of this game to the finale category with Jump Showdown, which is going to be great too, I'm sure of it. Tail Tag sees every player spawning into an arena, some with tails and some without. The objective of the game is to be equipped with a tail when the timer hits zero. If you have one, you advance, and if not, you lose. It leads to this free-for-all where players are constantly sprinting after one another as they desperately try to claim or hold onto a tail. A lot of the time though, there's enough players that you can hide behind an obstacle and avoid interaction with others for quite an extended period of time. On top of that, Tail Tag is a game that doesn't feel unique as it appears as both a team event as well as a finale event. And to make matters worse, one of the other team games, Jinx, feels a lot like it with a different twist, and it's a better twist. My biggest issue with this is that a lot of the time it also feels unfair because the grabbing animations don't always align with what happens. You'll lose tails when people aren't close to you and miss grabbing them when you're right on top of someone. It makes no sense and it pisses you off so quickly. Tail Tag is an alright experience as a survival game and ranks right in the middle of the three variations of this minigame for me. Oh, and by the way, if you're seeing Team Tail Tag footage here instead of just Tail Tag footage, that's because I spent like, you know, 7, 8, 9, 10 hours just trying to get this one game to spawn, and I couldn't get it to spawn, so I don't really have footage for it. Now, that may have changed after I recorded, so maybe just ignore this line, we will see. If so, I'll probably cut it. Anyway, Tail Tag is an alright experience as a survival game, and ranks right in the middle of the three versions of this minigame. Team games do a great job of switching things up, as you no longer can rely solely on your own skills. A joint effort is needed to prevail in these games, but many times they do end up being lopsided affairs. At the same time, it never feels fun to get eliminated because of lackluster teammates. I'd love to see a mode in the future that excludes team games from being selected. In fact, allowing players to customize a set of 5 games in private lobbies would be amazing, and I hope they do it in the future. For now, it's good to pair rivals up a bit, and it can make for some pretty intense gameplay in the final seconds of a team match. Team Tail Tag is the weakest of all the tail-based minigames because it never feels as tense as the other two modes. You'll constantly be around other players who have tails, and you can go long stretches of time without anyone really chasing you. All the strengths and weaknesses that apply to the solo version remain true here. The difference is that, because this is a team game, you can get eliminated and not be at fault, making it feel unfair. And yeah, you can argue that about all the team games, but in this specific case, it makes an already somewhat average or below average minigame worse. It's terrible. Egg Scramble is a collection-based minigame where players have to retrieve eggs and bring them back to their nest in a team effort. When the timer runs out, the team with the least number of eggs in their basket is eliminated. I don't particularly love this game, but I can't deny that it does lead to some hectic moments as you attempt to steal eggs out of other teams' nets and return them to your own. This is especially true when you manage to corral a golden egg, which are worth more points than a regular egg. Players are constantly using the grab mechanic to latch onto each other and force them to drop their eggs, which sometimes sends them flying. Out of all the team-based minigames, this is the one that has the lowest skill gap, and because of that, it feels more balanced. In other words, it's one of the only team games where I feel like if I lost, it wasn't necessarily because I had a crappy team. It ends up feeling more like the other teams were just in a better position than us when the curtain settled, which makes it feel more fair. I don't love Egg Scramble, but it's also not a poor entry either. Hoopsie Daisy is perhaps the most forgettable minigame to me, because it's so vanilla. It's not exciting enough to be memorable, but it's also not bad enough to loathe. Players are split up into teams and put their gymnastic skills to work as they climb platforms and jump through hoops to earn points. When the timer runs out, the team with the least amount of points is eliminated. 
it keeps you moving, but it lacks the chaos of some of the other games because you aren't really interacting much with other players. They mostly just get in your way instead of being a focal point of the action. This is also the mini game where you realize just how limited your range of motion is. The jump isn't very high, and the dive is even lower than that, which can lead to some frustration as you feel like you should have succeeded in getting through certain rings, and then you just don't, and it sucks. I'm gonna mark this one down as being a bad entry, but out of all the stinkers, this one is probably the least egregious. Hoarders is very similar to Egg Scramble, but it's not nearly as frantic, making it worse than the previous entry. There are a few balls placed on the map, and you have to do your best to make sure when the timer runs out, you're not the team with the least number of balls in your zone. If you're one of the two teams with a majority of the balls, you advance, while the other team is eliminated. My problem with Hoarders is that it can be a real pain to get these balls out of other players' zones, and that's in part due to these ramps in the middle of each zone that almost always stop balls from moving to another area. The dominant strategy then becomes rolling them along the edges to circumvent the ramps, and so many players just stand there and bat the balls back into their zones, knowing that this technique is coming. I'm not saying that the balls never change zones, because they do, but it just doesn't happen frequently enough to make this minigame as exciting as some others. Now I will note here, I've only gotten this game twice to pop up, and I only was able to record it once, so maybe I don't have enough experience, it might be better than I think, but for now, I'm gonna have to say it's a stinker. Jinxed is a slightly different take from Tail Tag that involves two teams. The goal here is to avoid becoming jinxed, or to jinx other players on the other team once you're already jinxed. In order to do this, you just have to grab other players for just a moment. The ones who get their entire team jinx first loses, while the other team advances on to the next round. This mode is actually far better than Team Tail Tag though, and that's because there's a permanence to it that doesn't exist in the other game mode. Once you're jinxed, that's it. Your goal becomes to go after the other players and jinx all their people before your team falls. And if you're one of the few last remaining players who are clean, it becomes super frantic as you run, jump, and dive across the field of play to avoid other players, which leads to some awesome juke moves and close finishes. The permanence of becoming jinxed means that you can't remain idle for very long without hurting your team. Whereas in Tail Tag, you can literally wait till seconds before the timer ends, snag a few tails, and then advance. Jinxed offers a lot more panicked, desperate, and ultimately satisfying gameplay when compared to the Tail games. In my mind, Jinxed is one of the better team games and earns a great rating from me. I've saved what I consider to be the best two team games for last, and first up is Fall Ball. Fall Ball is essentially soccer or Rocket League, but with our Bean Heroes. Players are split up into two teams, and the team that scores the most goals before the timer reaches zero is declared the winner and allowed to advance. I'm gonna say it right up front, that Fall Ball is very clunky and does need some work. There are so many times when the ball feels like it's getting hung up on players, or not reacting precisely in coordination with how the player hit it. Also, this game can spawn players in with an uneven amount of players on each team, which really isn't right. I mean, I guess you could say that about any of the team games, but it feels particularly noticeable here. I'm willing to overlook that for now though, because it just needs some slight tweaks. The groundwork is just super solid here, especially if you're a sports fan. There's an undeniable fun that comes from being put in a position to drive home a goal and propel your team to victory. And sometimes a football or a golden egg will spawn instead of a soccer ball, which adds a little extra diversity to the gameplay because it moves so differently than its counterpart. For the same reasons that Rocket League became so popular, Fall Ball is one of the best team games in Fall Guys. Rock and Roll is a team-based race where each squad is tasked with navigating their ball through an obstacle course in order to reach the finish line. The obstacles are varied and require a joint effort by the teammates as you must become one force to navigate the ball properly. 
There are three teams, but only the first two to cross the finish line get to advance. I really enjoy rock and roll, and that's mostly due to the fact that there's an additional level of strategy that I've picked up on. Yes, you can spend the entire time pushing your ball and trying to get it down the ramp, but if you notice another team is getting a leg up on you, you can sprint down to the ramp and try to block their ball from going into the net. There was one exhilarating match where my team was slightly behind, so I raced down there and trolled the shit out of the one team by blocking their ball. I proved to be an immovable wall, and it allowed my team to come back and secure the win, which felt amazing. The ability to do this is what gives this game a boost in my mind. If everyone was resigned to their own track and they couldn't interfere, it wouldn't be as good as it is now. Rock and Roll is one of the best mini games in Fall Guys because of this. And finally, these are the games that can spawn in the final round after a majority of players have been eliminated. These are the final gauntlets. When the curtain drops on these games, the round comes to a close and a winner is declared. Because of this, all of them have a heightened sense of anxiety. It's do or die in finale games. Out of all the tail tag games, Royal Fumble is the best. The handful of players that are left spawn into an obstacle course and one of them has the tail. The others must pursue and when the timer runs out, the person with the tail is declared the ultimate winner. There really isn't anything different about Royal Fumble when compared to the other tail games, but the thrill of being declared winner is enough to elevate this game mode. There's just another level of tension and drama when you know that this one is for all the marbles, and because of that, I will rate Royal Fumble as the best tail game, but it's my least enjoyed of the finale games, making it average. Fall Mountain, oh man, Fall Mountain is my ultimate demon. It's a mini game that I just can never seem to win. And no, that really hasn't affected my thoughts on it, but I just had to throw that out there. Fall Mountain is about climbing a tremendous slope filled with many obstacles like spinning propellers, large balls that are moving quickly at you, and spinner mallets that can wreck you. Reaching the top quickly is no easy feat, and if you get hit once, you're almost guaranteed to lose barring a tremendous collapse from the other players. The final challenge comes when you have to jump for the crown. Mistime it and you'll lose progress which will almost certainly cost you the match. This is the finale game I've personally received the most, and I would mark it as a great addition if not for one major issue. Fall Mountain is where I've noticed the most amount of bugs and glitches, whether it be from my own experience or that of others. I've seen so many clips of people jumping for the crown only to climb it and lose at the top because it doesn't register as being touched. There was also this one time where I literally just fell through the mountain after getting hit. I wasn't in first, but I still had a shot, and falling through the map sent me back to the beginning, which was super annoying. Because of these glitches, I have to denote Fall Guys as being average for now, but it could easily, easily ascend in the future. Well guys, I saved my favorite mini game within all of Fall Guys for last and it's called Hexagon. This finale game puts players way up above a vat of slime and the only thing between them and Gooey Death is a set of hexagon platforms. The last one standing free of the slime's grasp is declared the winner. The catch? Every platform will disappear after a fraction of a second, meaning you have to keep moving and stay above the competition for as long as possible before dropping to the next set of platforms. This requires a lot of player concentration, as you not only have to keep track of your own position, but also the position of other players to make sure that they don't take away your path and send you tumbling down. In addition to that, you must also be aware of the environment. There was one match where I had this huge lead, but as I fell to the next set of platforms, I hadn't processed that many of those tiles underneath me would be missing because of players standing on them. I fell right through to the bottom and hit the slime, leading to a heart-wrenching elimination. It taught me an important lesson, to be mindful of the space below me to make sure I didn't take another tumble. At the point of writing this, I only have 6 victories in Fall Guys, and 5 of them came on Hexagon. 
Maybe that's creating some extra bias in me, but I genuinely believe that Hexagon is the best minigame for forcing the player to engage tactfully and critically while also adapting to the movement of others. So as we tally the numbers up, we come to the conclusion that there are 13 great games, 7 average games, and 4 bad games. For me, personally, this equates to having 13 games that always excite me to participate and play in, 7 games that I can get through without many complaints, and 4 that make me groan when I see them pop up on the list. With 20 out of the 24 experiences being at least somewhat enjoyable, Fall Guys is able to thrive as a worthwhile Battle Royale game. And they can always go in and tweak games that aren't being viewed as favorably by the community. The most exciting part about all of this is that this is just Season 1, and that within a few months, we're going to be getting more mini-games to try out and enjoy. At the end of the day, no matter which mini-game is served up, there's a simple and addicting feeling of advancing forward in each round and culminating that emotion with a victory, and it's enough to keep you playing Fall Guys for a very long time. When it comes to presentation, Fall Guys smartly keeps it simple, yet colorful and cheery. This is a game about chaos, but not overly dramatic evil chaos, but instead the type that spawns from childhood splendor. The color palette is kept bright and cheerful, which subtly encourages players to stay hopeful about their chances to advance in each round. Obstacles are presented with enough contrast and color variety that it's never hard to decipher what is a threat and what is safe as you progress through each course. There's a very smart usage of colors throughout this game, and it helps maintain a pleasant atmosphere despite the frantic nature of the gameplay. There isn't much in terms of variety within the music, but I love what is on offer here. I gotta say, the music reminds me so much of the music in Crash Team Racing. I'm not sure why, but once I made that connection, I could not unhear it. I love that PlayStation 1 classic though, so this isn't a complaint. There's a goofy sounding quality to the music that helps maintain that jovial and happy-go-lucky mood that the game hopes to invoke in you. Yet it still includes some notes that highlight the competitive nature of the experience as well. There's a nice balance within the tracks that keep things lighthearted, but not too lighthearted. In terms of performance, this game definitely needs some more polish, but there's nothing aggressively wrong with it. I've noticed a handful of minor frame rate drops while playing, but nothing that cost me a victory in any minigame. There are also a handful of bugs that can feel cheap, but most of these seem to center around hit detection, which should be able to be patched relatively easily. For instance, there was that time I fell through the map on Fall Mountain. Also, the grabbing mechanic feels a little cheap sometimes too. There have been so many moments, especially in Royal Fumble, where I felt I had grabbed the tail but didn't receive it. On the other hand, I had a ton of moments where I felt players were far enough away from me that I was safe but still had them grab the tail away from me. None of these moments felt good, especially in a match that was for all the marbles. Besides these minor issues though, I haven't really noticed anything game breaking. At launch, I will say the game does freeze sometimes when you're trying to exit a match after getting eliminated and it forces you to restart it, but I think that's going to be fixed quickly. And yes, this game did have a lot of server maintenance at the outset, but that's due solely to the massive number of players that were engaging with Fall Guys. Perhaps they were a little short-sighted when releasing the game for free on PlayStation Plus while also keeping the server size so limited, but it seems to have been fixed now, which is good. I don't really blame the developers for the game becoming more popular than they originally anticipated. 
Since the title doesn't really have any sort of story to speak of, I figured it would be appropriate instead to discuss how this game handles cosmetics and monetization. Now remember, I can only speak to my experience on the PS4 at launch, but mostly everything seems pretty user friendly, at least for now. I mean, ever since Activision added microtransactions to Crash Team Racing Nitro Fueled months after release, I always worry that a developer or a publisher will begin squeezing money out of the players after the review cycle ends. And because of that, what I'm about to say applies to the launch of Fall Guys on PlayStation 4, and it may be different depending on when you watch this review. Anyway, just like in Fortnite, the cosmetics of this battle royale are one of its most important components, as they represent a great form of player expression. Part of the allure of this title is earning new hats, new legs, new colors, and new patterns in order to make your Fall Guy unique to you. You can mix and match different outfits to create one-of-a-kind looks for your bean, which leads to a lot of diversity on the field of play. At launch, there's a free battle pass that you can level up to earn these types of rewards at a pretty frequent rate, which is nice. And the progression does slow down a bit as you play, but that's really to be expected. Every match you participate in earns you two types of rewards, kudos and fame. Fame points work towards leveling up the battle pass to unlock more cosmetics, while kudos are a currency that can be used in the shop or to buy tiers in the battle pass. I haven't really purchased too many things yet, and have racked up a considerable amount of kudos to spend as I see fit. I don't really feel the need to buy more kudos in the shop because I'm earning plenty of them from playing and leveling up the battle pass, and I hope that's something that lasts. There is another type of currency called crowns, which you can earn from being the last man standing in a round, or by leveling up the battle pass. These are used to buy some of the more unique cosmetics in the shop, and so I'm thankful that crowns cannot be purchased directly. You have to earn these cosmetic items, and I think that's a wholesome touch. Now, the one downside here is that the outfits have been broken up into two parts, heads and legs. It means that if you want the complete set, you're going to have to spend double the amount. This is going to be bothersome for a lot of players, but I don't personally view it as malicious given how tempting it is to mix and match both heads and legs. And yes, they could have sold them together and then allowed you to break them up in the customization menu. I can't argue against that point. It could have been handled better, but it isn't something that personally bothers me. Now, sure, I am a bit biased on that because I got the game for free through my PlayStation Plus subscription, but I can see how this would hurt worse if you had to purchase the game on another platform, and I don't want to take away from that. I mean, it really sucks to have to buy a game outright and then potentially spend even more money on an in-game shop just to engage with a core part of the experience, and in this case, that's customization. The good news is that the selection of cosmetic items is only going to continue to grow and grow as the game moves forward with new seasons and new game modes. It's always commendable when a game launches for free and then doesn't force money out of the player by gating away cosmetics in an unfriendly manner, but instead they make the player want to give back to the developers for providing such a fantastic user experience that has a lot of promise going forward. In my opinion, if they're able to keep the monetization where it's at now, with it being as player friendly as it is, then the future is looking bright for Fall Guys. Sure, it can improve in some ways, but I don't think it's nearly as bad as some of the other games we've seen. In conclusion, Fall Guys is in a really awesome position moving forward. The mini games on offer here provide a strong foundation for the game to build off of. In other words, what we have now feels substantial and meaty enough to keep the game populated over the next few months, while also providing excitement for what's to come with the release of each new season. Almost every minigame on offer now is enjoyable to a degree, with over half of them being very fun and worthwhile to engage with. And that's because a majority of the games keep things frantic, chaotic, ever moving and fun without ever taking itself seriously enough to invite massive amounts of player frustration. 
The goofy nature of the game is only propelled further by the charming character designs and the equipable cosmetics, as well as the delightful design of stages and the music that accompanies them. There's a small number of bugs and glitches that can be buffed out over time and can be overlooked for now, given how player-friendly the experience is. Monetization at launch does not hold the player back as aggressively as other battle royales, but instead invites them into the shop with loads of currency already in their hands just by playing the game. And the first battle pass doesn't even need to be purchased, it's just given to you for free. The reality is that if you're playing on a PlayStation 4 at launch and you have PlayStation Plus, you don't have to spend a dime on this game, which is amazing. If you are in that boat, you have no reason to not give Fall Guys a shot. It's an addicting and laugh out loud experience that will see you checking back in regularly for more chaotic fun in a fresh new style of Battle Royale. Thank you so much for watching. Please leave a like if you enjoyed the video. Consider subscribing for more. Follow me on Twitter at NopeNapNarp. And as always, have a nice day, and take care.